This is your host, Andre, speaking. Hope you have enjoyed our audiovisual presentation of the Pharaohs of Egypt, Part 1. If by chance you have not seen it, please get hold of it and enrich yourself. May the human story of the first Egyptian monotheistic royal couple increase your social skills. The ancient civilization of Egypt reached its zenith during the 18th dynasty and then it slowly declined. Why? Well, history tells us that they rejected God's offer of salvation, as we'll see, and then they also persecuted his people. If you and I reject heaven's gift of salvation and become cruel and unsympathetic towards those around us, like the ancient civilizations did, we too are headed for a fall. For many centuries, the history of ancient Egypt was veiled in mystery. Why? Well, it's very simple. Man lost the art of reading hieroglyphics. But then something dramatic happened. Napoleon of France invaded Egypt in 1798. Shortly afterwards, in 1799, one of his scientists discovered a flat stone with three different languages on it at a place called Rosetta. Its modern name is Rashid. After careful investigation, they discovered that it carried an identical message in three different languages. At the bottom was Greek, in the middle Demotic, and on top hieroglyphics. A new world of knowledge opened to the scholars after Jean-Francois Champollion deciphered this ancient script. I must tell you that it took the man 22 years to complete the job. Well, I think we'll have to learn it a little bit faster. The Egyptians used the Rebus method in developing their alphabet and we are going to do the same. For instance, if you want to create the word believe, all you have to do is to place a picture of a bee and a leaf next to one another. Let's try. There you are. There you have a bee and a leaf. We've mastered the Rebus method of writing and now we move on to the next step and that is to decipher hieroglyphics. It's going to be exciting. In this picture from a tomb, Egyptian tomb, you're looking at three Egyptian liars. We want to write in hieroglyphics that nobody should ever believe a liar. I will only decipher the first character and you will have to do the rest. What do you see? Nobody. What is this? A bee. What do you see? Leaves. What kind of instrument is this? It's a liar. And nobody should ever believe a liar. Congratulations, you've just earned your master's in this interesting field. Our previous lecture on Egypt ended with the death of that great pharaoh, Tutmosis III, who drowned in the Red Sea. Can you still remember the date? March 17, 1450 BC. And now we come to the next pharaoh. History calls him Amenhotep II or Amenophis. The record tells us that he became co-ruler of Egypt with his father, Tutmosis III, in 1453 BC. And of course he was crowned as the sole ruler three years later in June 1450 BC. By the way, you are looking at my daughter called Loretaki on the left in this picture. Let me tell you the story as we enter this tomb. During the time of the Exodus, he was suppressing a revolt in Saro, Palestine, and only returned to Egypt in June of 1450 BC that year. Can you still remember when the Exodus took place? We saw it, March 17, 1450 BC. Tell me, what did he find on his return to Egypt in June of that year? Well, all the Hebrew slaves who built the beautiful temples and palaces were gone. 
And what happened to his mighty co-ruler and father, Tutmosis III, the Napoleon of Egypt? Well, the Bible tells us he drowned in the Red Sea during the Exodus with a large component of the mighty Egyptian army. Let's look at some of his tomb pictures. But the greatest shock that awaited Amenhotep II on his return was the discovery that his firstborn son died during the tenth plague. Now keep this in mind, in a minute we're going to see what lie, Egyptian lie, his second oldest son told to explain why he and not his older brother became the next pharaoh. As I stood next to his sarcophagus, I thought how he must have felt when he heard about the unnatural death of his oldest son. I suppose all broken up inside. I've discovered through the years that if we do not manage hurt, it can turn into hatred and bitterness. Most people, bitter people, started out as hurting people. And this is exactly what happened to him. On his arrival at Memphis, he was so bitter that he decapitated a few Semitic prisoners of war from Sarah Palestine and later displayed their heads on the walls of the Karnak Temple. When I looked at his mummy next to that of his father, I thought how easy it is to change from hurt to aggression. The Bible says the only therapy for hurt is to forgive. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. The route on which God led Israel to Canaan after leaving Egypt was a long and a difficult one. At the oasis of Marah, the water was so bitter they couldn't drink it. So God graciously healed the water by placing wood into it. He was trying to teach them to depend on him for changing the bitter experiences into something sweet. When we bring the cross of Calvary into our bitter experiences, we too will become sweet. Exodus 13.17 gives another reason why God took them on the long and difficult road on their way to Canaan. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. What did God know? Archaeology tells us that at the very time the Israelites would be heading north, Amenhotep, with the largest portion of the Egyptian army, would be heading south. And true to scripture, there would have been a great battle discouraging God's people. God, who was looking from above, led his people on a detour through the Sinai Desert to the Promised Land in order to avoid a bloody confrontation. My dear friend, maybe you are on one of life's difficult detours right now. May I assure you that a loving shepherd has your ultimate prosperity in mind and he wants to lead you to eternal fountains of joy. Trust is leading in your life. And remember the road to success and the road to heaven is always under construction. The next pharaoh, second oldest son of Amenhotep II, is called Tatmoses IV. Archaeology has uncovered an Egyptian lie that confirms the biblical truth of the death of the pharaoh's firstborn son. Egyptian history never would have recorded the fact that a god more powerful than their own gods triumphed over them. Come with me to the Sphinx at Giza and I'll show you where they willfully and wrongfully rewrote biblical history. In ancient times, the Sphinx represented the Egyptian god called Harmakis. Can you see the stela between his front paws? Let's move a little closer while I tell you what is written on it. It says that one day when Tutmosis IV, the young prince, the second oldest son of Pharaoh Amenhotep II, returned from a hunting expedition, 
He fell asleep in the shade of the Sphinx. Then he heard a voice say, If you will remove the sands from my front paws, I will make you the next pharaoh. He obeyed, and according to him he became the next pharaoh. But tell me, is that true? Why did he become pharaoh and not his older brother as the custom dictated? Was it really because he cleared the sands from the paws of the Sphinx? No, my friend. The lie of the steel of Tutmosis IV establishes the authenticity of the Bible, which clearly states that the pharaoh's oldest son died during the tenth plague. You are looking at the next pharaoh and his wife. Would this be a Tutmosis or an Amenhotep? Well, in this case, it's Amenhotep III. He left Karnak and built himself a palace on the western side of the Nile. But when you visit the site, this is all that's left of it. It is called the Colossi of Memnon, and this used to be the entrance to his huge palace. The statues of the pharaoh produced music when the wind blew onto it. When you read his biography, you'll notice that he began moving away from the worship of Amun as the most prominent god in the Egyptian pantheon of gods. From this point in time, the name of Aten, A-T-E-N, which is the symbol of the unseen creator god, became more and more prominent. After his death, his son, Amenhotep IV, became the next ruler. The name means that the Egyptian god Amun is in control of his life. But he dropped this name and changed it to Akhenaten, which means that he now serves Aten, the invisible creator god. His new belief sent a shock wave through the entire Egypt. He left off the worship of the multiple Egyptian gods called polytheism and the goddesses. His new monotheistic belief became an incentive to move away and build himself a new capital. So he left Thebes or Karnak where all the Egyptian gods were worshipped, polytheism, and moved the new center of worship north to Akhetaten, and this is where he built his new capital which is called today Tel El Amarna. Many thoughts went through my mind as I crossed the Nile on my way to the ruins of the capital of Akhenaten. I wish I had time to tell you about some of the cuneiform inscriptions found here. It is called the Amarna tablets, they came from all over the Middle East. They were pleas for help from the kings of Saro Palestine and other places to come to the rescue from the invading Habiru or the Hebrews. This is part of the site where he built his new capital and called it Aketaten, which means the horizon of Aten. Because he became a monotheist, worshipper of one god, they killed him and his wife, and only recently have archaeologists begun to unearth their fascinating story. I found this bust of Akhenaten in the Egyptian Museum in Berlin. A scholar by the name of Lionel Kassin says he was the sole pharaoh in Egyptian history to boast the distinction of an intellectual. And by the way, he was also called the first individual in history. Let me introduce you to his beautiful wife. Can you tell me her name? Nefertiti. Akhenaten had advanced ideas concerning the way women should be treated, and this was due to his religious beliefs. What is Atonism? Well, whenever you see the sun disk with sun rays coming down to people, you know that this is Atonism. Akhenaten and Nefertiti did not worship the sun disk. They worshipped the unseen creator God. The sun disk was only the symbol through which the invisible creator God poured out his blessings upon mankind. This beautiful relief illustrates it. Look at the sun rays. 
What do you see at the end of each sunbeam? If you look carefully, you'll notice little hands. They are telling us that God supports us. But look at the two on the left and the two on the right, opposite their nose. What do you see? The onk, the symbol of life. In other words, we are dependent upon God, not only for giving us life, but also supporting us. What a beautiful symbol of total dependence upon God. Akhenaten's theology, of course, was in conflict with the traditional Egyptian belief that man possesses natural immortality. Haughty pharaohs believed that because of their immortality they were on equal par with their gods. Akhenaten rejected this concept and believed in the cosmic sleep of the soul. While all the pharaohs built their tombs on the western side of the Nile, Akhenaten was different. He built his tomb on the eastern side of the Nile. Archaeologists excavated a beautiful hymn he wrote concerning the Creator and his creation. And what is so amazing about this hymn is the fact that 17 lines of this hymn correspond perfectly with 17 lines of Psalms 104. Listen to these thoughts as you look at his bust. Quotes, you created the earth as you wished. When you were by yourself before mankind, all cattle and kind, all beings on land who fare upon their feet, and all beings in the air who fly with their wings, you created them all. End of quotes. Just look at this. The Queen Nefertiti kisses one of her daughters. Now this was something strange and new in Egyptian culture. But the message was so clear. It says, kiss your child. Can you see the ankh? It says that God also creates tender emotions like motherly love. So the message is to mothers and fathers, please kiss and hug your children. Touch them every day. I had the privilege of visiting the tomb of one of his physicians, a man by the name of Pentu. Let's go inside. This was a great moment in my life. What do you see? The sun motif. Life and support, it says, come from above. The doctor held the same convictions as did his king. Whether driving a chariot, helping children, or doing the ordinary chores of life, we need strength from above, says this mural. Dr. Pentu also depicted Pharaoh Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti praying to the unseen God. It appears that the religion of Akhenaten gave him a mature outlook on life and self-acceptance. Accept your bodily defects, he said. If you have a bit of a pot belly, so what? Allow the artists to portray you just as you really are. He introduced a new word in Egypt called ma'at, which means truth. His lips were rather big, but this is how he told his artists to depict him. You know, while I studied Amarna art, I asked the Lord to help me to accept myself just as he has made me. I must tell you, my legs are very thin. And I must accept that fact. So ladies and gentlemen, Akhenaten says, A smile on a wrinkled face looks far better than a frown on a facelift. What really matters, says Akhenaten, is not what you look like, but how kind you are to others. People will remember your kindness and forget about your physical defects. Akhenaten and Nefertiti chose to display the beauty of family relationships rather than material achievements. Here you are looking at three of their six daughters, Meditaten, Mikitaten and Ankin Senpaten. At this stage, the other three sisters were not yet born. Can you see what's happening here? Dad kisses one of his daughters. Mother Nefertiti holds one of them 
close to her heart. Just look at this exceptional relief. Two sisters relating to one another in a loving way. Father Akhenaten and Mother Nefertiti says that a happy home is far more precious than all the wealth and splendor of Egypt. My dear friend, let us spend a little more time with our precious loved ones. Let's show them a little more affection. Let our homes be a little heaven on earth. Speak gently to one another. And please, let us touch one another more frequently. I'm so glad archaeologists found this broken piece of relief. Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti. Can you see her sitting on his lap? And she's got two of their daughters on her lap as well. What else do you notice? A bouquet of flowers and fruit. Men, if your wives are not too overweight and your children are not too big, take them on your lap when you get home and put your arms around them and tell them that they are the most precious possession you have. The ancient formula for a meaningful relationship was a gentle touch. What a simple, easy way to create a meaningful and lasting relationship. The religious reforms of Akhenaten and Nefertiti were more than Egypt could tolerate, but thanks to dedicated archaeologists who uncovered the messages they left behind. No one will ever be able to destroy these messages of kindness, love and consideration. While sculptors were busy on the second bust of Nefertiti, she and her husband, Akhenaten, were brutally murdered. Murdered because they believed in the cosmic sleep and not in the immortality of the soul. Murdered because they did not build their tombs on the western side of the Nile like all the other pharaohs did, but on the eastern side. They were put to death because they dared to believe in Ma'at, the Egyptian name for truth and I bring honor to this great couple. Before their death, their third eldest daughter, called Anken Saint Paten, married a man by the name of Tut Ank Aten. In this relief, his wife touches her husband. What a message to every married woman. Please touch your husband. One day they received a message from the priests of Thebes at Karnak, telling them to forsake the worship of the creator god Aten and revert back to the worship of Amun. What would you have done? Stick to what you know is the truth and die for it like your parents did or forsake truth and live? By the way, the last great test that will come to every human being will be the choice and the manner of worship. More about this when we come to a future lecture on Revelation 13 and 14. Tut Ank Aten, which means in the living image of Aten, had to change his name to Tut Ank Amun, which means in the living image of Amun. He had hardly begun enjoying kingship and learning all the names of the Egyptian deities when he suddenly died. Some scholars believed that he was also murdered. I visited that famous tomb in the Valley of the Kings. It was here on November 25, 1922, when Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon had a glimpse of the most incredible burial treasures ever discovered in the history of mankind. But today the tomb is empty except for the king's gold coffin which I will show you in a minute. For the rest of his funeral treasures we'll have to visit the Cairo Museum. Let's go there and have a quick look at it. This is a model of the boat on which Tutankhamun's mummy was transported across the Nile to his final resting place in the Valley of the Kings. Just look at this fine workmanship. At the entrance of the tomb they found these life-size statues of the king. It's black wood covered with gold. 
Egypt had an oversupply of gold, so they produced these shoes of gold for Tutankhamun to walk around in his afterlife. Because he forsook the worship of the Creator God, he had to collect quite a few minor Egyptian gods to accompany him in his afterlife. The Apis bull was one of them. The Israelites followed this cult and made themselves a bull in Sinai and worshipped him as well. They found something very interesting in this little sarcophagus. Let's open it. This is what Howard Carter found. He opened the lid and found beautiful alabaster objects. Guess what was inside? The king's intestines. Here we see the goddess Serpet guarding the huge chest in which the mummy of the king was found. The artwork on this chest is superb and of course it is done all in gold. And now for a most exciting discovery. When they opened this huge chest, they found a shining golden coffin. There it is. They opened it with great care and expectation. And what did they find? Another beautiful coffin, much like the first one. Just look at the superb workmanship in Goldsmith. And then, with still greater care and expectation, they opened this one as well. And what did they find? A third coffin. Howard Carter was breathless when he saw this. You know, I like to watch the facial expressions of people as they look at these treasures. It's quite a treat. Today, the third coffin can be viewed in Tutankhamun's tomb in the Valley of the Kings down at Luxor. Let me show you what they found when they opened the third coffin. The Death Mask of the King May I have your permission to exhibit his mummy? It's going to be a shock. You just have one second to look at this pathetic little figure. He looks so sad without his gold trimmings. I saw two royal thrones amongst the Tutankhamun treasures. This one portrays Egyptian polytheism. As I've mentioned in a later part of his life, Tutankhamun worshipped all the different Egyptian deities. But then in shocking religious contrast, you also see this monotheistic throne among his treasures. Here he is still called Tutankhaten, meaning in the living image of Aten, the creator god. And his wife, daughter of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, is still called Ankensenpaten before she changed her name to Ankensen Amun. This relief shows their dependence upon the God of heaven and earth. Tell me, how did this throne get in here? As I looked at Tutankhamun's statue, I thought, he knew what was right, but for the sake of fame and wealth, he sacrificed his principles, which were more precious than the gold of Egypt. You know, it is so typical of our fallen human nature. And next to his statue is that of his wife's Ankensen Amun, who used to sit on her father's lap. So often we know what is right, but we do what is wrong. Have you ever discovered how weak you really are? You know, we need urgent help from above. Contact with the invisible creator God made Akhenaten and Nefertiti kind people. I've discovered through the years that the more I look up to God, the more I change. I tend to become a little kinder. It is a law of life that by beholding we become changed. The Bible says of Moses, the man who grew up in Egypt, in Hebrews 11.25, he chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Verse 27 says, He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. 
May God help us, like Akhenaten, Nefertiti and Moses, to persevere in doing what is right. May He help us to be a little kinder to one another. Let us focus our eyes more and more on the lovely Christ, who loved us so much that He died for us. Moses died here at Mount Hanibu in Jordan. But God honoured him for choosing to follow him with a special resurrection according to Jude verse 9. May God help you and me, my dear friend, to become humble and kind like Moses and Jesus and enjoy the future resurrection. After watching this audiovisual presentation, I have decided to spend more time with my wife and tell her how much I appreciate her. What about you? May God help us to distribute more loving touches than cold censure and criticism.